Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Squarespace, the all in one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code Know How. And by lynda.com. lynda.com is an easy and affordable way to help you learn. Instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on business, software, web development, graphic design, and more. For a free trial, visit lynda.com slash knowhow. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash knowhow. This week on Know How, we're going to take you with a mouse without borders. Brian's going to show you how to fix a busted screen, and then I'm going to teach you how to fix a congested network. The know how it's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. Oh, and there's there's no Brian today. That's right. Brian has abandoned the show just to do some sort of honeymoon thing or whatever it is. I, I never understood that. Yeah, evidently we're not important enough. He doesn't care about the know how audience enough to you know power through it. But uh, it's okay. It's okay. No, no. Well, welcome back. With, uh, with open arms next week. But seriously, we uh, wish Brian well on his honeymoon. We hope everything's working out okay with him in Florida, and uh, we wish his wife all the best of luck. Like some of those places out the coast, there isn't a Wi-Fi connection that you can connect to. You're right, Brian. Yeah, actually, that is a big problem in Florida. Now, speaking of problems, we had a lot of people comment in the Google Plus group about the episode we did on 321 Super Backup. Essentially, I showed you how you could take a old uh, netbook and turn it into your sort of your central backup station, taking in everything from Dropbox and OneDrive and any cloud storage solutions, and then pushing it along with the data on your computer and your NAS into Amazon's Glacier. It was a cool solution, but it did spark quite a bit of discussion, which we're always happy to see. I, I want to bring out some of the uh, the questions and posts that we had from the G Plus group, starting with Ed Lazarus, who posted, I have one of those uh, these with an AMD Hudson that would be perfect for the 123 backup project. They run Windows or Linux fine, and they're low power. I was using it with an Ubuntu server, 12.04. After I upgraded that, I ran Windows on it. But if you don't have a netbook or you can't find one, this works fine. And actually, that's a great one. That's a Foxconn Nano PC. The, the idea, of course, is you could use any computer. It doesn't have to be a netbook. The one thing I would suggest, and I think Ed nails this, is you want something low power. This is going to be running all the time. If it's your desktop that's using three, 400 watts, that's not good. But if it's a netbook or one of these that's using five, six watts, yeah, I, I think you can manage that. We also had a comment here from Brent Burnett, who uh, suggested one of the things to consider with the Super 321 backup as shown with an older netbook is that most cloud storage clients for Windows will sync all content after install, therefore reducing the overall storage on the netbook itself. If you have a ton of data on different cloud storage solutions, you could run out of local storage. Thank you very much, Brent. That's actually that's an excellent point. Uh, on that particular netbook, I wasn't all that worried because it had a 500 gigabyte rotating hard drive, which, again, I, I don't want it to be fast. I don't need it to be fast because it's just doing backup in the uh, background. But if you do have more than 500 gigabytes in your collective cloud, so in your Dropbox, in your OneDrive, in your Google Drive, whatever you're using to sync to the cloud, that could be an issue. Now, what I would suggest, at least for my setup, is if you do start to run out of space on the local drive, as long as you've got that NAS mounted, why not store the cloud storage on the NAS? And then the same job that I created that backed up the NAS will also back up your cloud storage. Now, that's not ideal because it does make for a major point of failure. If your NAS gets disconnected, if it dismounts, it's going to stop backing up. But that's something to consider if you do have a crazy amount of storage up in the cloud. 
Finally, we got a, uh, a comment here from John Mink who says, I just watched Know How 108 and I think I missed something in the super backup portion of the show. Where did the versioning come in? I don't remember Glacier having any versioning, but it's been a few years, I could be wrong. And everything else just seems to be basic backup. Well, John, you didn't miss anything. That's, that's actually right. You see, Glacier isn't really a service. It's not a backup service the way you might think of, say, Carbonite or, or a backup service from another uh, commercial business. Glacier is big, dumb storage. That's all it does. There's no bells, no whistles. Files you put up get stored. Files you take down get copied. That's it. Now, the versioning comes through the software. You could buy some really, really sweet software that does the versioning in the background and gives you a nice menu system based on what it sees in Amazon Glacier, but we use Fast Glacier, and Fast Glacier is free. So there's only so much you're gonna get out of a free client. Now, the way that we did versioning was we set those switches. Remember, we had the switches we could add at the end of the command line that did things like make sure you delete files or don't delete files that have been deleted out of the sync. Make sure you keep all versions of a file. So let's say if I have a file named test and I save it 15 times, it will save all 15 different versions of test. It will just have a different date on each file. That's versioning. And I know it's messy. It's, it is really, really messy. When you consider that you might have a thousand files of the same thing on the Glacier, it, it's, it's not all that attractive, but that is versioning. And, and that ultimately is what's going to save your butt if you find out that the document you were working on was messed up 32 versions ago. So does it have versioning the way we would want it? No. Does it have versioning the way that it will work? Yes. Could you get something better for Amazon Glacier? Probably, but you'd have to pay for it. Now, keep your questions coming because I do want to answer more questions about the 321 backup. It's vitally important for geeks to make sure that they've got their data in a safe place. And I am firmly convinced that 321 Super Backup is the way to go. No, it's, it's neat. Yeah, it is. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, very, very neat. And, uh, you know, hearing it from Cranky Hippo, ain't no better way to put it. Now, let's get into the first segment of the show. I want to talk a little bit about something that I've been using the last couple of years. Now, if you're an old hand at uh, building your own computers, you probably played with a KVM. That was a keyboard video mouse switch. Now, back in the day, before we had all these internets and networks and stuff, the KVM was the way that you would save desktop space. Remember, we didn't really use laptops. We were all on desktops because we were old and crotchety and we wanted the kids to get off our lawn. So what we would do is in order to save the desk space, rather than having a monitor for say five different desktops you might be running behind your desk, you had a single monitor, a single keyboard, and a single mouse that used a switch, either mechanical or electrical, to switch between the desktops. Super simple solution, but it worked. And it was one of these things that people just got used to. If you had to work with multiple computers, a KVM was one of the easiest ways to make sure that you didn't have to have a, just an explosion of keyboards, mice, and monitors sitting in your workspace. That kind of changed when we got into the laptop slash mobile slash tablet era. KVMs are still out there. You can still find them. In fact, I, I still use them, but the utility is not so great. I mean, with a laptop, you've got the screen built into the, the computer. So it's not like I can share this screen with other computers. Or, or can I? I've, I've been playing with a piece of software that Microsoft created in their garage. If you don't know about the garage, it's sort of Microsoft's version of the Skunk Works. It's based in Building 4 on the Redmond campus uh, for Microsoft's head, headquarters. And it's uh, a place where employees can come in their off hours and tinker or invent or innovate. And what they found is that sometimes the project, projects that people work on inside the garage become so valuable, so cool, that they release it into the wild. And that's what happened with a program called Mouse Without Borders. Now, what is Mouse Without Borders, you might be asking yourself? Well, imagine a KVM for laptops. Here's how you install it. Click. Click. Clicky, 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 clicky. Boop, 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 To set up Mouse Without Borders, you first need to download the program from the Microsoft Download Center. 
The program will work with 32- and 64-bit versions of Windows XP, Service Pack 3, Vista, Server 2003 and up, Windows 7 and Windows 8. Any of those can be added to the unified desktop. Once downloaded, install it first on the computer that will act as the master of your Mouse Without Borders setup. Though each computer will bear the load of the programs running on its screen, the master will coordinate all the other computers participating in the Mouse Without Borders Network Unified Desktop. Click through the standard prompts, then when you get to the Let's Get Started window, you'll be asked if you've already installed Mouse Without Borders on another computer. Click No, and you'll get the security code and computer name. Make sure to write it down or leave the window open so that you can copy it into the other installations. Now move to the next computer that you want to use in your unified desktop. In our case, I'm using a second Acer S7 Ultrabook, but you can mix and match computers and screen resolutions as long as they're running one of the supported versions of Windows. Download and install the program as you did with the master station. This time, when you get to the Let's Get Started window, and it asks you if you've already installed Mouse Without Borders on another computer, click Yes. Then enter the security code and computer name that you've received from the installation on the master computer. Assuming that your computers are on the same network and connected properly, Mouse Without Borders should automatically connect to the master station and establish a unified desktop session. If you click on the Mouse Without Borders tray icon, you'll be brought to a screen where you can configure the orientation of the computers inside the unified desktop. You can change the order, just as you would with multiple monitors, in the Windows desktop, and you can choose to place the screens in two rows. Quick note, Mouse Without Borders will work with multiple display desktops, so if you connect two or more computers that each have multiple monitors, the cursor will flow off the border of each desktop edge onto the next desktop. Now, one of the things that people are going to know about this product is they're always going to be comparing it to other products that they may be using, like, for example, Synergy. Synergy is a fantastic program, and it does work across platforms. So if you do work in a cross-platform environment, that may be the way to go. Me, I work almost exclusively in a Windows environment, and all the workstations that I may want to share my desktop across are Windows, so it doesn't make sense for me to pay for another project uh, product when Mouse Without Borders is absolutely, positively free. And it's also incredibly lightweight. I've never had a problem with Mouse Without Borders. I know some people had issues with some of the earlier versions, but they've really matured the software. Uh, now, a, a couple of hints. The first thing is this. Make sure you're running a wired connection. If you have an Ultrabook, you may be tempted to run it over wireless. And it will work. I mean, as long as you're on the same network, you will be able to add a desktop to the unified desktop. The problem is uh, wireless is inherently unstable. All it takes is for you to have a little slightly wonky connection or a little bit of lag. And especially if you're sharing more than two desktops, uh, the experience is less than optimal. Just don't do that and just make sure that you're using a wired connection. The other thing to remember is that it's not just moving across mouse on the, on the desktop. In fact, Alex, if you could go ahead and show the, the dual. This is both of these computers on my desktop right now. You can see that I can move my mouse in between them, which is cool and that, that's nice, but it's, it's not just that. It's not just like, okay, now I'm controlling this computer, now I'm controlling this computer. Uh, I actually can copy and paste between desktops. So for example, here's the Mouse Without Borders installation. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and then onto this desktop, I'm going to go ahead and paste it. And uh, when I do that, it will move it over. So this is a really nice way to move files between computers if you don't want to have to use an intermediate step or if you don't want to open up a share on different computers. The other thing you can do is you can copy and paste text, which is nice if you're uh, doing you know, multiple things with creative workstations. Something it cannot do that some other products can do is this. Alex, go ahead and go back to that shot. So if I've got a window, if I'm dealing with a multiple desktop, I'm kind of used to being able to spread the window across or move the window between my screens. You can't do that with a, a mouse without borders. When you get to this border, it's just going to say, no, I, I, I can't do it. Now, that's kind of annoying, and I wish it would do that, but uh, it would require a level of interaction with the kernel that I don't think they're willing to do for mouse without borders. Uh, one of the things I really like about this product is the ability to leverage fully the power of each workstation. Uh, w when you were using a, a KVM, you you had the ability to, uh, you know, 
run a process on this computer, then run a process on this computer, then run a process on this computer, so on and so forth, which allowed you to maximize the amount of resources you were running on each workstation. That kind of faded with some of the screen sharing uh, uh, programs because you would only be using the processing power of the master station. As I move between desktops in my unified desktop, I can do that old school using the full power of that workstation, which means I could, say, expand my uh, desktop work workstation that I use for rendering videos, have it next to the desktop I do for, um, for word processing, next to the desktop I have for my email. It's, it's just kind of a nice way to be able to fully utilize the gear that I've already bought. So that's Windows Without Border. I'm going to make sure that all of the notes are in the show notes. You'll have the link to go ahead and download it. And what I'd say is this. Give it a try. You may go with something like Synergy, which, again, the, the people in the chat room are big fans of. It is a really good program, but this is free. See if maybe it might fit all your Mouse Without Borders needs. Now, when we come back, we're going to be going into a segment on how to fix the screen on your phone. We gave uh, Brian Snubs old broken phone, and we said, hey, this thing's busted. See what you could do with it. I was uh, sitting in my bedroom with my laptop, and I was playing Titanfall. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that happens a lot. Uh, thanks, Brian. I think he's lost it. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a pause and thank the first sponsor of Know It Alls Everywhere. That's right. It's Squarespace. Now, ideas are great, and you want to get your ideas out into the world. The problem is sometimes people get caught up on the website. They get caught up on the minutia. They get caught up on registering the domain, the perfect domain, the name that, that gets you the, the attention that you want, of, of making sure that the back end is set up, and then the front end. What, what server are you going to use? What framework? What sort of content management system? Well, you could worry about all that, or you could just go to Squarespace. Squarespace is the one-stop shop on the internet for getting your idea, your project up and running and out into the world. If you have uh, used Squarespace in the past, then you know what I'm talking about. It, it is so easy to get everything, your content, your writing, your photos, your videos up and ready to display to the public. It's a, it's a great way to share a weekend blog or provide the ability to jumpstart a side startup project with a professional looking site that has the ability to be quickly and easily tailored to your exact needs. Now, some of the reasons why people have come back to Squarespace year after year is that they're constantly improving their platform. They've always got new features, they've always got new designs, and they always have better support. They're always striving for, for the better way to help you when you make your project. I mean, it doesn't help Squarespace if they sell you something and then you don't do anything with it because then you're just going to cancel your subscription and you're going to go elsewhere. So they understand that that attention to customer service is as important as the first sell. Now, they are, they're also incredibly flexible. This is great for DIYers. There's a set of tools to create your own website without any code knowledge. It's from design tools like the layout engine to the logo creator. You get to create your brand online, and Squarespace helps you to do it. They've also got beautiful designs. They have 25 beautiful templates for you to start with. And with that logo creator, with that tool for, for tailoring your website, you can take that template and turn it into something that truly is unique. It's also easy to use. It's, you know, it's just drag and drop. It's click. It's right. It's, it's display your photos. But if you do need help, help is always available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Plus, there's a completely redesigned customer help site for easier access to self-help articles and video workshops. They also provide e-commerce for those sites that support it, which makes it easy for you to accept payments or, especially for nonprofits like the ones that I've set up, a, a way to get donations. It's also only $8 a month, so it's not going to break the bank. We're talking about something that's inexpensive and high quality, and it's so rare to get those two things together. Squarespace is also mobile ready, which you're going to appreciate if you've ever tried to create a WordPress blog, and it doesn't look as good on, say, a, a phone as it does on a tablet or a desktop. Squarespace's back end will automatically adjust your content so that no matter what your user is looking at it with, it's going to look beautiful. Speaking of beautiful, even their code is beautiful. I, I uh, also host Coding 101 here on the Twit TV network, and I love it when the, the code is just neat. It's, it's simple and yet elegant. And that's what you see when you look at the source for Squarespace. Now, Squarespace takes care of all that stuff, all that minutia, the back end, the front end, the hosting, the domain. They take care of that so you can just worry about your content. So here's what we want you to do. 
we want you to start a free two-week trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you decide to sign up for a Squarespace account, make sure to use the offer code KNOWHOW to get 10% off and to show your support for KNOWHOW. We thank Squarespace for their support of KNOWHOW. A better web awaits, and it starts with your new Squarespace. Well, we want to thank Squarespace for their support of KnowHow, but now it's time for you to figure out how you fix your busted phone. We've all known someone who's dropped or shattered their phone screen, and my someone happens to be a coworker named Shannon Morse. She was ever so lucky to have dropped her Nexus 5 from a very short distance, cracking her screen. Well, seeing that I'm just an all-around awesome guy, I offered to fix it. For the knowledge. I'll go through the steps on how to fix and replace a screen on the Nexus 5, but the procedure is very similar to any other mobile device with a cracked screen. So first, you're going to need the parts. I purchased the screen front replacement from Amazon for about $100. Unfortunately, you can't just replace the glass from the digitizer, as the glass and digitizer are fused together in an unholy bond, frustrating any do-it-yourselfer. If you got some tweezers, a guitar pick, and some time, you're in luck. Those and a heat gun are the tools you need for this job. Fortunately for me, I have some iFixit tools to help me along with this project. Step one is going to be powering off the device. We don't want it to be on when we're removing all these parts and everything. Next, remove the SIM card tray. Opening the back is simple enough if you have a guitar pick or, for me, a plastic spudger. And just start at the bottom of the case and work your way along the edge, popping the little rivets along as you go. Step two, with a Phillips screwdriver, uh, there will be six screws holding on the back plate at the top of the phone. Uh, once you have those removed, gently pry off the plate and set it aside. Then at the bottom of the phone, there are four more screws that you need to remove. And then you can remove that plate at the bottom. Along the side of the phone is a long connector uh, and gently release that from the board of the phone and also the tiny connector uh, that goes to the battery. On the left and the right of where the battery is are the 4G and 3G antennas. Be sure to unplug both of those from the board as well. Next, you can gently pry, use a plastic tool to pry the battery up. At the bottom of the phone, release the connector that is connected to the bottom board and then gently pry with a plastic tool because this bottom board is going to be glued to the bottom of the case. And if you break this, you're going to be in trouble. So just take your time and slowly lift it up. Next, it's time to release the connectors for both the front and rear facing cameras. Again, be careful while you lift these up because they are de delicate. Now that you have the connectors uh, disconnected, you can pry the board up from the chassis of the, of the phone. With the board out of the way, you can remove from right to left uh, a black tape gasket, the front cam, the headphone jack, the ear speaker, and a rubber gasket, and the rear camera. Down at the bottom of the phone, peel back the board just a little bit so then you can slot it through uh, once we, we're ready to remove the screen. Now that we've removed most of the components from the chassis, we can go ahead and get our heat gun out. And since the screen is pretty badly cracked at the bottom of the phone, I'm going to apply some gaffer's tape to try and hold it together. Carefully go over the phone with a heat gun. You want to get it warm enough to heat up the adhesive, and then you can gently push from behind to see if it'll come apart. Now with the majority of the screen removed, I'll heat up the last bits of glass at the bottom of the frame to remove them. And once the frame is cleaned of any more glass, I can insert the new one. Now it's time to add a bit of glue to the screen edges. As I was in a hurry to finish this project for Shannon since she was going to DEF CON and needed the phone for that, I used super glue. There is glue out there that you can get that will come apart when heated, but I didn't have the time. So let's just hope Shannon doesn't break the phone again. Slide the connector through the chassis and place the screen into the frame, making sure to apply pressure to the edges for a good seal. Now it's time to work in reverse. Put the cameras back in place, along with the head jack and the microphone. Reconnect the tabs as you go along with the antennas, and make sure to screw the plates in before putting the back protector back on. Turn on the phone and make sure that everything is plugged in properly. 
Clean the screen and you're good to go. All in all, this project took me about three hours. If I were to do it again, I could probably do it in about a quarter of that time. Now that's all left to do is return the phone to Shannon and we're good to go. Now there were a couple of things that Brian did that I, I know the people in the chat room are kind of cringing at. Like using gaffer's tape, not the best. Better than, better, much better than duct tape, but gaffer's tape combined with a heat gun can leave some nasty residue all over the place. Now, luckily, he was just going to throw away the screen anyways, but if you got any on the sides, that stuff's so hard to clean up. The other thing is the crazy glue. I, I always assume that it's going to break again, so I would never use crazy glue, but this is Cranky Hippo's project, and uh, you know what? If he wants to mess up his gear, who am I to argue? No, it's, it's neat. Exactly. See, it is pretty neat. Now, we also want to take a, a moment here to thank the second sponsor of uh, Know How, and it's Know-It-Alls. And, of course, us being the purveyors of, of knowledge that goes into your knowledge hole, it's got to be lynda.com. Now, what is Lynda? Lynda is the source on the Internet for filling that knowledge hole. And it's, it's not just about tech stuff. It's about anything that you may need to get learned up on. Do you want to know about business? Yeah, they've got courses for that. Do you want to know about how to uh, publicly present? They've got courses for that. Do you want to be able to fix your computers or, or learn a new uh, computer software suite? Lynda.com has courses for pretty much everything under the sun, which is what makes them such a great complement for know-how. Now, Lynda is easy and affordable. It's a way to help you learn on the internet at your own pace. You can instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on software, web development, graphic design, and more. Lynda.com works directly with industry experts and software companies to provide timely training, which means that it's often the same day with a new software release that they'll have courses ready for you to learn that new software. It's a great way to keep up to date and to update your skills. All, course, all courses are produced at the highest quality. These, these aren't homemade videos on YouTube, which I love. I mean, that's where I came from. But there's something about a professional shot, a, a good lighting, good audio. You, you don't want anything to get in the way between you and your learning, and Linda knows that, and that's why they make the videos the way that they do. They also include tools that uh, let you learn at your own pace, things like searchable transcripts or playlists and certificates of course completion, which you can publish to your LinkedIn account, which is great if you're a professional in the field and you want your prospective employers to know what you've trained in. Uh, whether you're a beginner or advanced, lynda.com has courses for all experience levels. You get to learn while you're on the go with the lynda.com app for the iPhone, iPad, and Android, or you can learn at home with your laptop or your desktop. You get to choose. It's one low monthly price of $25, and that gives you unlimited access to over 100,000 video tutorials. For me, I, I've been using Premiere Pro a lot, so I've been going to lynda.com to, to learn all the things that I've forgotten over the years. So, you know, sometimes when, when you edit for a living, you forget that it's more than just copy-paste transition. Sometimes you, you, you need a refresher course on how to make things work, and that's what Lynda is best at. Well, premium members with an annual plan can also download courses to their iPhone, iPads, or Androids and watch them offline, which is perfect if you want something for reference in the field when, when you're going to be away from an internet connection. It's, it's an incredible resource for those people who just need to fix things and go. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try lynda.com. We want you to check out their courses on simple Android development, on practical cybersecurity, on Monday productivity pointers, and songwriting and Logic Pro. We want you to stay current with all software updates and learn the ins and outs to be more effective and productive. And that's where Linda can help. And we've got a special offer for you to access all those courses free for seven days. Visit lynda.com slash knowhow to try Linda free for seven days. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash know-how and we thank linda for their support of know-how uh, we've got uh, a bit of a question this is actually a really really good question that we had from a member of the audience who was having some issues with this network and he hoped that he hoped that we could help uh, in fact this question came to us from uh, timothy s in los angeles who writes i have a 24 port tp link tlsg 102d gigabit ethernet switch Connected to it is my router, 12 network cameras, three dual gig NAS, and five workstations. Two of the NAS are dedicated to storing the HD video streams of the cameras, three cameras over each gigabit Ethernet port. The third NAS is connected via iSCSI to the workstations where we edit video. 
For some reason, we're getting heavy network congestion. I've tried turning jumbo frames on, but even then, we can't edit video from the NAS unless I disable half of the security cameras. The specs say it should work. The switch has a 48 gigabit per second switching capacity and 35.7 million packets per second forward rate. Even with the HD streams from the cameras, I should be way under the maximum. I tried swapping out the switch with my spare, but the problem persisted. Please help. Well, Timothy S. from Los Angeles, California, first of all, great job. No, seriously, this is a really, really good job. You did all the things that you should have done, all the things that were the low-hanging fruit on the troubleshooting tree. You tried swapping out the switch to make sure that it wasn't a problem with the switch, and you found out that the problem persisted no matter which switch you were using. You also tried turning jumbo frames on and off, which is a good way to push more more data over your networks with fewer packets. And even with those jumbo frames on, you found out that it didn't decrease the network congestion problem. And you also fixed the problem by disabling several of the cameras in your security camera network. Now, right there, that gives me all of the information I need to help you fix the network you have. And here's the best part, you're not gonna have to pay a dime. Unless you want to, you can always send something to me, Father Robert Balliser, care of the Twit Brick House, 140 Keller Street, Petaluma, California. But seriously, let's talk a little bit about falling. Yes, I'm making it rain up in here. Let's talk about falling victim to the spec fiction. Now, we're going to start with this. This is a really, really ugly representation, Timothy, of what your network looks like. You've got 12 cameras, you've got two NASs that are dedicated to receiving the high definition streams from those cameras. You've got a 24 port switch from TP Link. You've got a router sitting up top, and then you've got five workstations and a NAS that does nothing but serve those workstations so that they can edit video. What you're telling me is that, well, uh, with all of these on, you can't get enough throughput from that NAS to your workstations to edit properly. But when you disable half of them, then this works just fine. Now, I know that the specs say that this should work just fine. I know that the specs tell you that, uh, yeah, this, this should should be great, but unfortunately, the specs lie. Now, uh, let me go ahead and pull it up on my screen because I, I don't think Alex uh, should be able to pull up on his. This is what the TP-Link specs tell you uh, is here. And actually, let me enlarge this a little bit. It tells you that it's got 48 gigabits per second of switching capacity, which sounds like a tremendous amount. 48 gigabits, are you kidding me? It's only a 24-port switch. It also tells you that it's got a 35.7 million packet per second forwarding rate. Now, those two are important because it tells you what kind of fabric you have in your switch, so how much data can you push through, and it also tells you how many packets you can forward at any given time. You see, switches like these, dumb switches, work on store and forward. The frame comes into the memory. Uh, the processor says, okay, where are you going? It checks its table to figure out where it should go, and then it forwards it. That's the store and forward. Now, if you look at most of these, uh, I'm not going to call them low-end, but I'm going to call them consumer-level switches, you're going to see that they have those exact same specs, 48 gigabits per second and 35.7 million packets per second that it can forward. Problem is, even though it's there, it lies and I can prove it. Now let's start with that 48 gigabits per second. I know why they say 48 gigabits per second. They say 48 gigabits per second because you've got 24 ports of gigabit, right? And each port has two directions, in and out. So each port is technically two gigabits. So it can forward 48 gigabits. Oh, it's got a, 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 a switching capacity of 48 gigabits. But that's not how it works. If you've got a, a 24 port switch, if you've got tra uh, traffic coming in, it also has to go out somewhere. So basically half the ports are listening and half the ports are receiving. Now you can have traffic going both ways, so that basically means you max out at about 24 gigabits per second. Uh, there is no magic port inside the switch that somehow stores all that data and then regurgitates it. You have to have a constant throughput and the maximum constant throughput is 24 gigabits per second. So right there you know that the specs are lying to you. It's a PR trick. Someone's saying, look, this is better because it's got bigger numbers. But that's not how it actually works. But that's not the problem because I I'm sure that your switch is more than capable of forwarding all the data it needs to. The problem is the, the switching, so the packet switching, the packet forwarding, the store and forward. It tells you that you've got 35.7 million packets per second. 
But if I already know that my switch tops out at 24 gigabits per second, it means at max, I'm even the smallest packet length possible, I, I'm only pushing about 23. Now that 23 is a theoretical maximum, and from what you tell me with your troubleshooting, you're getting nowhere near that. Now, I'm not saying that TP-Link is, is crap. Actually, it's, it's pretty good. TP-Link makes some good gear, but they do over-spec a lot of their gear. Uh, now, you, you could go this route. You could go ahead and buy something like this. This is an Enterasys D2. This is an enterprise class switch. This will definitely work. This has all those extra features because it's a managed switch, but this 12-port PoE, it's going to run you about $1,000. You're probably not going to want to do that, especially if you bought a TP-Link. You probably want something that's a bit more budget conscious. So here's the good news. You don't have to buy anything. You already have all the gear you need to make this work because you told me you tried your backup switch and it didn't work. But what this means is that you can segment your network. If you look at this, right now, the problem is that you've got all of this going into one switch and when these cameras are running, the switch is too busy. It can't forward fast enough to let this NAS work. So all you have to do is go ahead and take that spare switch that you've got and divide your network. You're going to put all the cameras on one switch. You're going to put all the workstations and the second NAS on the other switch. And then you're going to connect them through the router. Now, here's the beauty of the way that modern switching works. Because it's a store and forward, because it figures out where the packet is going before it actually sends it off, unless these cameras are doing a broadcast, as long as they're only talking to those NASs, none of the traffic from this switch will make it to this switch and vice versa. That means that it doesn't matter how fast and how busy these cameras get, it's not going to affect your performance when you try to use your workstations. Best part of all, you've already got that switch, so just plug it in and you'll be good to go. Now, this, this is not going to work for everything. I mean, of course, you're going to have problems with, with devices that you have to access. For example, there'll be some of these workstations that will want to access cameras over here or access information on the NAS, and it will have to go through the router. So if that starts being a problem, all you have to do is instead of going through the router, just directly connect the two so that you can bypass what was probably also a weak switch built into your router. And that, folks, is how we do it. I mean, because switches don't work like hubs, because they don't just broadcast frames and packets everywhere, most of the time, network congested can be fixed just by putting in an extra switch. Now, uh, that's been a lot for the day. We've actually covered a lot of material. We've gone over uh, Windows Without Borders. We talked a little bit about 321 Super Backup. Brian showed you how to fix a screen, and uh, I just told you how to fix some network congestion. But I wanted to give you a little tease on what's coming in the future weeks of know-how. The first thing is this. This is an Acer Predator desktop. We had this a few weeks back on Before You Buy. Cool desktop, very nice, but people asked us, well, it's running 16 gigabytes of memory, it's running with a hard drive instead of an SSD, it's running with a video card that I wouldn't choose. What's my bang for buck if I were to buy an Acer Predator or a desktop like this and then want to upgrade it? What parts should I replace? What parts should I upgrade? So over the next couple of weeks, Brian and I are actually going to tear this thing down. We're going to replace the hard drive, the memory, the video card, and the CPU piece by piece to show you the performance gains that we're going to get from each component, which will give you, after the end of the series, the ability to make an informed decision. But it's not all just desktops, laptops, and performance. We're also doing this. Uh, we have Project Lunchbox, and we love Project Lunchbox. And there's still a few episodes left in Project Lunchbox because we're going to be modifying the suspension. We're going to be adding cameras. I'm trying to add an autopilot. But I think it's time for us to start playing with, uh, with aerial remote control vehicles. Now, this is a really cheap drone. This is not that expensive. It's kind of a... a crab device. It does have a camera and it tends to crash into things a lot. But we're going to be using this as sort of the jumping off point to talk about building your own drones. Now, uh, it, we, we've seen DJI. We've seen uh, a few of the others that are a little on the pricey side. But uh, with, the, with this, crash it, we're going to be able to build something that, uh, well, you're going to be able to play with and hopefully crash a lot 
without spending a lot of cash. The show is out of control. Show is absolutely out of control. Thank you, Cranky Hippo. Now, uh, remember, you can always find our show notes at twit.tv slash kh. If you have a question about Mouse Without Borders, if you have a question about the procedures that Brian used to replace the screen, if you have questions about how I fixed network congestion, be sure to drop by. And uh, as long as you're there, go ahead and check the little drop-down menus that show you how you can subscribe automatically to Know How so you can get each and every single Google-licious, Geek-licious episode into your device of choice. If you want it in your iPad, your iPhone, your Android phone or tablet, your Mac, your PC, your desktop, your laptop, your zombie zoo, no matter what it may be, we've got something for you, a way to get know-how into your no-hole. Actually, that's the name of our basement place downstairs. Also, don't forget that you can find us on Google+. Plus. Just Google for know-how. You're going to find a group that's 7,600 members strong. The cool thing about that group is it's not just Brian and I. In fact, most of the time, it's going to be your fellow members who answer your questions. And a lot of those amateurs are going to need your help when they're putting together your, their projects. So drop on by, see what we're working on, and maybe if you post a project, maybe if you post a question, we'll use it on the show. Also, I, I want to thank everyone here at the Brick House who makes this possible, specifically Alex, who probably doesn't have a camera pointed at him right now, but, oh, he does. Okay, that's kind of ominous. Um, Alex, if you could tell the folks where they could find you on Twitter. I'll be in the no-hole. Uh, Alex will be on the no-hole, but you can also find him at A-N-E-L-F-3, and L-3. You can find me at Padre S-J, that's at Padre S-J. And uh, until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasser, and... Over here is uh, Cranky Hippo. Does he say anything? Yeah, that's Cranky Hippo. And uh, now that you know, go do it.